Good evening. Mohammad Sharik from Shimoga in Karnataka has been identified as the one who was behind the pressure cooker bomb that went off in Mangaluru over the weekend. He's been identified as inspired by the terror outfit ISIS. He was planning to place the bomb in a much more crowded locality, before which it blew up in an auto rickshaw in which he was travelling. Is there a fear of spread of radical terror in South India which some political parties and politicians may be in denial about? How was this man, who was wanted in at least two other cases, one of which was UAPA, not under the radar of agencies, so much so he was able to travel from um, Mysore to Coimbatore to Mangaluru? And most importantly, how did he manage to procure fake Aadhaar cards and acquire a false identity before carrying out this blast? But first, the story so far. Four weeks, two blasts, both with an overlapping, sinister, bigger picture coming through. Mangaluru, Karnataka, November 19th. Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu, October 23rd. Blast in car then, blast in auto rickshaw now. Near a temple then, headed to a temple now. In both cases, bomb ingredients recovered point to a bigger terror plot in the works. This is the man at the centre of it this time, badly burned in the Mangaluru auto rickshaw explosion. Mohammad Sharik boozing with a pressure cooker bomb in signature ISIS style. Police have been on the hunt for him since September in another case. Searches at Sharik's rented house reveal indications of a bigger terror conspiracy in the making. Gelatin powder, circuit boards and more used to manufacture crude bombs. Besides signs of links to PFI and to one Abdul Mateen Taha of the Al Hind ISIS module active in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So Abdul Mateen Taha is also his and he is a main hander as of now as for our information of Sarik. His acts has been inspired and influenced by some terrorist organization which is having global presence. So it is due to that and uh, he has tried to learn this manufacturing on, on his own it seems. On to efforts underway to decode an under investigation bigger ISIS terror plan in South India. In Mangluru, Mohammad Sharik, Abdul Mateen Taha, possible threads lead to ISIS. In Coimbatore, Jami Shambin, the man who was killed, allegedly had close links to Zehran Hashim, the suicide attacker in the 2019 Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. Again, the ISIS thread. There's also a Kerala thread under probe, one Mohammad Azaruddin, who allegedly heads an ISIS module in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. The Mangaluru blast on Saturday and the NIA probe that's underway points increasingly to a bigger web of terror being spun for South India. Has this vicious web been played down for too long? How urgent are investigations needed ahead? Is a larger South India ISIS terror design finally unraveling? Let me go across to Arunima, my colleague, uh, who has more details on the story. And I think what is top of mind is two things. One, how is this man who was arrested in 2020 is wanted in at least two UAPA cases? How was he able to move freely from Mysore to Coimbatore to Kerala and then, of course, in Mangaluru, where this blast happened over the weekend? And secondly, how did he manage to get these fake Aadhaar cards? He was living in a, under a false identity for the last few months in Mysore. To answer the first question, not just uh, Karnataka police, even the National Investigation Agency knew about his antecedents. He had been booked under UAPA and yet not only did he manage to flee, but like you pointed out, he managed to travel. This entire conspiracy, it seems, uh, began on 15th of August. On the occasion of Independence Day, there was a clash in Shimoga and uh, there, was, there were some arrests that were carried out as violence broke out between two groups. This uh, person, Sharik, is, is, uh, is uh, accused of being part of that same module which carried out uh, the violence there. From there, let's come uh, to Coimbatore. On the 2nd, uh, 3rd and 4th of uh, September, 
His SIM card records show that he was in Coimbatore. What was he doing in Coimbatore? Because soon after this visit, we saw that car bomb blast going off. Is there a linkage there? Then the next time that the, that the red flag should have gone up was when that Tungabhadra case happened. In Shimoga, on the banks of River, River Tungabhadra, a trial blast was carried out. A case was registered. Two people were arrested, but Sharik managed to give the slip yeah. even then. And then he travelled from uh, uh, you know Shimoga to Coimbatore, like I pointed out. Then Nagar Coil, Uti, uh, Aluva in Kerala, came back to Mysuru. Now, how did he manage this? He managed this because he was faking his identity. We know about the Hubli Aadhar card, which he had stolen. But there is evidence now coming that he duped one Surendra, a resident of Uti, by saying that I am a poor guy, I have lost my mobile phone, please help me. And therefore, Surendra says he provided his own Aadhaar details to help uh, Sharik procure a SIM card. Okay. In two other districts, he has managed to procure Aadhaar cards using this log logic. Police will have to tell us what really went wrong there in their probe. All right, Arunabha, stay on with us. We're getting a piece of breaking news which... Uh uh, is again uh, something that Arunima is just putting out, this information that she's sharing with our viewers. The central government has now issued fresh guidelines for accepting any form of foreign hospitality, which means without prior permission from the central government, whether it's legislators, judges, members of political parties, members of parliament, can no longer accept any kind of foreign hospitality. Remember, this controversy arose after Rahul Gandhi's visit recently to foreign universities, where he had criticized the government and its policies. Let me go across uh, back to Arunima with more details on this. Clearly, how is the government going to sort of characterize or find out what is uh, foreign hospitality? Surely members of parliament are invited from time to time by foreign think tanks or foreign universities. Uh, if they have to get permission every time this invite comes forth, uh, it's going to be a logistical nightmare. Yes, but they have issued this guideline and, and government of India insists that there is nothing uh, unusual about these guidelines, that they are updated periodically. But like you just pointed out, controversy arose uh, when uh, Congress's MP from Vyanad uh, visited foreign universities and uh, at those uh, you know, events criticized the central government. Controversy has also uh, you know, come up uh, when uh, members of the left party, CPIM and others, uh, visit, uh, you know, say, China. Uh, so the government was uh, you know, concerned about those. And now how do they de define foreign... Uh, uh, you know, hospitality. Uh, they, they're defining it under the FCRA Act of 2010 and uh, under the FCRA Regulation Rules of 2011. And they have actually given a definition of foreign hospitality. It means any offer, not being a purely casual one made in cash or kind by a foreign source, by providing a person with the cost of travel to any foreign country or territory or with free boarding, lodging, transport or medical treatment. So those are the kind of, uh, you know, um, right. uh, you know, hospitalities that they're categorizing under this. And and then under six, uh, section six, they're saying judges, legislators, members of political parties, none of them can accept this hospitality without taking the central government's permission. How the central government will give that permission is also detailed under section nine of these new guidelines. All right, we'll see how this story plays out. Clearly, the opposition would have a bone to pick uh, on this. We'll see uh, how this progresses politically. Meanwhile, let's go back to our guests uh, on the big story that we're tracking about, Mohammad Sharik, uh, the man who carried out the Mangaluru blast, of course. It was sheer providence that uh, it blasted much before he was supposed to take it to a much more crowded locality. But the fact that he was under the radar of the agencies and still managed to give them the slip traveling to multiple cities and, of course, resulting in what happened in Mangaluru over the weekend. Dr. Lakshmi Gowda, a spokesperson of the BJP uh, in Karnataka, Lavanya Balal, spokesperson of the Congress Party in Karnataka, Sushant Sareen, senior fellow of the Observer Research Foundation, and Shantanu Sen, his former joint director of CBI. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi Gowda, this man, Mohammad Sharik, he was and accused in two separate terrorism-related cases, <coughs> both of which uh, he was charged on, uh, both of which uh, are uh, UAPA cases. Uh, he was arrested in 2020 and then later left out on bail. How was this man able to travel to multiple cities, to Coimbatore, to Uti, to Nagarkoil, Alua in Kerala, and then, of course, eventually uh, living in Mysore for the last couple of months under a fake identity? This is a man accused under UAPA, was he not under the radar of the state police and the central agencies? Yes, sir. He was still very much on the radar of this both central and the state governments. But he has managed to fake this evidence. Uh, so go government is losing no time in, in gaining all the information regarding how he how has to manage to fake this evidence and all. So I think this is the last time it has happened. And uh, BJP government is doing everything. And it has uh, no, can left no stone, uh, no stone unturned in not repeating it again. 
uh, think this is the last time it was going to happen. Uh, let me ask Lavanya Balal, is there a sense of denialism, if you will, among certain political parties and politicians in South India, that there is no radical Islamist terror in South India, uh, that people there are educated, therefore, uh, you know, something like this cannot happen there. Look at this case itself of Mohammad Shariq. He had links with uh, Mubin, Mubin who died in the Coimbatore blast. Uh, and then Mubin had links with one of the bombers in the Easter Sunday bombings uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, the fact that uh, even the state government of Kerala has admitted that as many as 100 people had gone for ISIS to Syria or Afghanistan over the last 10 years. This has been submitted in court. Is it time to end this denialism that there is the spread of radical terror in the South, just like there is the spread of radical terror anywhere else in this country, and that people and politicians need to stop to be in denial about it? Good evening. First of all, it is um, heartbreaking. I'm a resident of Mangalore. It's my hometown. It is heartbreaking for me that time and again, Mangalore has been in the news in the recent few years for all the wrong reasons. Having said that, my question is, Al Hind, you know, uh, the organization that he's being suspected of being a member of yeah. by both uh, our uh, state police and the NIA, my question is, how can he evade uh, all the investigative agencies for two years? Uh, if he's using fake Aadhaar cards, aren't Aadhaar cards supposed to lead you to the right information? How can another person be using my Aadhaar card as a question? Isn't it supposed to be something that avoids these kind of situations. Uh, when you are asking me about our political organizations in denial, I don't think any organization in India, uh, any political organization for that matter, is in denial about uh, people harming our own national interest. For all the political parties, I'm sure the national interest comes first. No, and of course, and nobody is doubting, nobody is doubting your national interest credentials, but Fact also remains that uh, there has been overt and sometimes covert support between radical elements like PFI and SDPI and political parties. It is this sort of covert nature of support that gives uh, people like Shariq the sort of atmosphere that emboldens them to carry out this kind of attack. And I, I think one question you validly asked is, how was he able to fake his identity? That's an absolutely valid question. But I think uh, what is also concerning is, People feel that because there are certain, and I'm not naming one party or another, I'm not naming any party, I'm just saying there seems to be this atmosphere where people feel, some people feel that there is deniability, therefore they can carry this out. Otherwise, what explains how he was able to travel to Coimbatore? In Coimbatore, one of his associates dies, he's the main accused in the Coimbatore blast case. He's traveling to other parts of uh, Karnataka, Kerala, South India, and then lives under fake identity in Mysore for the last two months. Exactly. The question is, if Al Hind is a terror organization, how is it even allowed to exist? How is it not wiped out in the nation from 2020 to 2022? It's it's a huge, you know, uh, a scary thing. It's it's it, it does not make any citizen feel safe when you know organizations like this are thriving in the nation. Correct. No, I want to ask Sushant question, Sarin, I, Back in September, I, the Shivamoga police had begun investigations into two of his associates, Maz Ahmed and Syed Yasin. Both of them under UAPA, and so was this man. He was also charged under UAPA, but somehow he slipped under the radar of the agencies. And secondly, most importantly, oh. there was a Sushant Sarin, There was a blast that happened on the banks of the Tungabhadra River, where now the police are saying, in hindsight, that that was perhaps a precursor to what happened in Mangaluru. Even after that blast in Tungabhadra, which is supposed to be some kind of a trial run, how come this guy was not spotted uh, in the radar of the agencies? Uh, Zaka, that the agencies have to answer. But I think uh, this fellow who had been poked in here was out on bail. Now, I don't think you can blame the agencies or the government for, you know, for something that the courts have done. And I think maybe the courts also need to be held responsible and accountable uh, for, uh, you know, giving bail. But I suppose this is now the order of the day that even somebody who is alleged to have links with the ISI uh, is allowed to uh, stay in, you know, relative comfort of a house arrest uh, because, uh, you know, just because he is 70 years old, Sushant, it doesn't Sushant, matter just how Just a quick intervention. Paid, but... The case that he got bail for was a UAPA case. My understanding is yeah, so... even those people who are let out on bail, particularly if they are charged under heinous sections of, uh, of the law, there is surveillance, right? 
I mean, they, they are monitored uh, closely. Bail is also under conditions, Zaka. right? Zaka, it becomes very difficult to monitor people all the time, you know, 24-7 uh, with the kind of resources that most of the police forces have. Number one. Number two, do we know what the bail... I, because I am not aware of it. Uh, you people have people on the ground. Just check what were the bail conditions. Was there any bar put on his being able to travel? Now, if there is no bar put on his being able to travel, then he can travel pretty much everywhere. The third problem is... Uh, was the Aadhaar card, uh, the, the fake Aadhaar card, yep. was it uh, like a fabricated Aadhaar card or was it uh, a, a genuine Aadhaar card made in a fake name? Uh, you know, no, no, he that stole basis, somebody else's identity. To... There is a gentleman by name Premraj Hudagi. He's a railway employee. Remember, he's a government employee. Yeah, yeah, that... This man changed the photograph, kept all the other details the same put his mug on uh, Mr. Hudagi's uh, Aadhaar card and then went around saying that which he was is, Mr. Hudagi. You know, which, uh, uh, you know, Zaka raises the question that uh, because Aadhaar card has now become, uh, you know, an, a marker of identity. Yeah. And in most cases, what happens is that you just flash your Aadhaar card and that is good enough. Uh, can there be, and I don't know whether there can be, because, for example, if you are uh, 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 at the railway station or at the airport, uh, how do you scan whether an Aadhaar card is genuine or not? How does a landlord actually manage to find out whether an Aadhaar card somebody is flashing before him is genuine or fake? Everybody has a trained eye. So yeah, that is a problem. Okay. Uh, the only the only good thing which has happened in both Coimbatore and uh, uh, this particular incident is that we have been lucky. We have been lucky yeah. that this these guys are idiot bombers that they have blown themselves up and burned themselves up with their bombs and they haven't uh, been able to hurt any innocent person or kill any innocent person. Uh, but it is a matter of serious concern. Uh, two things. One, uh, you know, the questions which you are raising, that how does a person like him go out on bail uh, and then carries on the kind of activity without any of the security agencies becoming wiser to it? One. And the second and the more important question is, was there some kind of a nexus? Uh, you know, right now, there are only straws in the wind. Yeah. But was there some kind of a, a terror module which was operating and he was part of it? Were these individuals acting on their own, uh, you know, on their own volition and carrying this out? Was there a larger organization behind it? Who no, so indoctrinated I want to bring in them? two aspects. How were they now, it's clear that think, this man was inspired by ISIS. Now, of course, I agree with Sushant. It's not possible to monitor each and every individual. And the problem with ISIS-inspired attacks is it, uh, it is usually restricted to one or two individuals in, in each cell. But I want to bring Mr. Shantanu Sen. And please explain this to us, sir. Now the police are saying that Shariq had apparently gone to Coimbatore in early September. Uh, he was staying there in a dormitory uh, in Coimbatore. He used another associate's Aadhaar card, an associate by name Surendran. He's under arrest. There was that blast that happened in the Coimbatore local party office of the BJP and RSS uh, in which a man named Jamisha Mubin, who was supposed to be the mastermind of that attack, he died. Now there are links emerging of Mubin and Shariq. Also, Shariq is said to have had uh, contact with Mateen Ahmed Taha, who is a member of Al-Hind IS, uh, who is constantly under the radar of uh, the agencies. How is it that two terrorists, one who died in the Coimbatore blast this man had links with, and one who is a known IS operative this man also had links with, and yet his name did not pop up in the radar of the agencies? It can't all be, you know, uh, uh, lumped up because he was uh, uh, using a false identity and living under false uh, uh, names. Mr. Sen. Raka, this is the case... Raga, this is a case of intelligence failure. If intelligence has failed us, then everything can happen. And it is not, this, this has not happened the first time. You remember the incident of Dr. Jali Sansari. He used an explosive in Nasik police station. He was caught, he was bailed out. And thereafter he made various explosives and use them intermittently all over Maharashtra, all over Pune, and also in parts of Karnataka. He was ultimately caught by the CBI when he did those six train blasts together in 1993, 6 December 1993. So 
if there is an intelligence failure, you cannot do much. The time, the time has come for specialists, both in intelligence and investigations in the terrorist field. Terrorism is a new offense, relatively new, because mm -hmm. if I recall, the first such incident happened in 1981 when the Sikh terrorists attacked Niranjan Singh, the secretary. And thereafter, there was Atwal murder in 83. And thereafter, <laughs> you know what happened in Punjab. Yeah. So the then Home Secretary set up a terrorist fee organization comprising of the C CBI, the IB, and various police station police chiefs of North India because then terrorism was in the North India, and there was a systematic intelligence functioning. So let me be very clear: there is a lot of anger and wrath building up. Yeah. Let, us be, there, let there be no doubt about it. And the intelligent community of this area is the angry. And they will plan. They, will, they are planning with IEDs now. Mm -hmm. But they will plan with bigger things. Yeah. Other people will join them. So we have to look ahead. And we have to create special forces who will only tackle... Terrorism. No, like, like I we said, it is have sheer providence that terrorism. this pressure cooker that he uh, that exploded Absolutely. in Mangaluru, it happened inside an auto. We it, have it, it sort succeeded. of bombed earlier than, uh, than exactly. what it was intended so for. So we should be alert. Yeah. We should be alert and we should start creating, as Mr. Pradhan had done when the Sikh terrorism, we created a special force. Mm. And that is how Punjab cell came up. That is how the STF came up. And that is how the NIA has come up. Okay. Now the states should create special intelligence wings to deal with terrorism. Just with and terrorism they should be alone. permanent force. Okay, that's it a fair point that you made. Yeah, but, but, yes. but politically speaking, let me go to uh, go back to Dr. Lakshmi Gowda. When you banned PFI a few months ago, and a whole bunch of their associates got rounded up, many of them uh, are in jail. The claim that was made politically by the BJP was that this will uh, make a huge dent to terrorism in South India. But that doesn't seem to have been the case. You had the Coimbatore uh, blast that happened after that. You now have this case in Mangaluru. And like I said, it's sheer luck that it uh, blasted off in the auto that he was traveling in. Otherwise, had he placed this in a crowded market or a railway station, tens of people would have died. So, so what happened? What happened to all those claims, Dr. Gowda? Dr. Lakshmi Gowda. Ma'am, please unmute and talk. Yeah. Dr. Lakshmi Gowda, can you hear me, ma'am? Please unmute yourself and, and, and answer the question. Okay, I don't think uh, she has the audio line. L let me go back to, uh, um, to Lavanya Balal. And I, again, I come back to this point, Lavanya, that this has to be a, an apolitical issue. Terror is terror. You can't be viewing that from the prism of you know, Hindu or Muslim or A party or B political party. There has to be a unified approach to crack down on terror. Unfortunately, that's not what we are saying. Again, without naming any parties, I'm saying there are political parties who take a very rather soft view of, uh, of what's been going on. I disagree. I am not sure which party will take a soft corner about this. But Zaka, look at this uh, blast happening in Kerala, for example, which is a neighboring uh, state. And we have a very porous border with Kerala for, for Mangalore. Kanur, there was a uh, in Kanur on July 7th, there was a blast which killed a father son duo. And if you look at uh, Congress in Kerala, it had raised this question in the parliament about the connections to uh, SDPI. And uh, of course, uh, a couple of times, if you look at the past few years news, there were also bomb blasts where in uh, RSS party, uh, RSS workers were involved. And uh, our op leader of opposition, Satishan, had raised these questions in the uh, you know sessions in Kerala, questioning uh, why the Kerala government has not been able to curb this. So I would totally say, Zaka, there's no compromise when it comes to security okay. of our people and the national security. There shouldn't be as well. And uh, okay. we hope Dr. that Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Gowda is back on the uh, broadcast. Dr. Gowda, please, please respond. When you banned PFI a few months ago, 
Uh, it was said, politically claimed, that this will make a huge dent to terror activities in South India. But we've had the Coimbatore blast after that. We've had the, the Mangaluru blast after that. So what happened to all those claims? Uh, so we have banned PFI very recently. Coimbatore blast has happened much before that. And uh, STPI, the link with STPI couldn't be erased completely, even after banning PFI. If we ban STPI also, which is having ulterior motives all the time, and plots terror attacks uh, should be banned completely. If you ban both PFI and uh, uh, STPI, I think it will have uh, effectively COVID no, but can man, the terrorism. Who is stopping you from forms. banning SDPI? You run the government in the state, you run the government in the center. Please go ahead and ban SDPI. Election Commission is an independent constitutional machinery. Election Commission has to take a stand because SDPI is one of the parties. It is a registered party with the Election Commission. Election Commission has to take a stand regarding this. Okay. I think he will take a positive stand with this. Sushant, I'll give you the final word. How do you see this story moving? I, I think I keep coming back to this that uh, it, it at least puts paid to this whole theory that, you know, uh, those who are poor, who don't have access to education, those are the guys who end up becoming terrorists. That is not the case at all with the likes of a Sharik or a Mubin who, uh, 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 who was responsible for the Coimbatore blast. I think this has become increasingly uh, evident now uh, with these cases emerging in South India, that this whole bogey that uh, poor okay. and disenfranchised are the ones who take to terrorism, not at all. Zaka, you're absolutely right. Somebody like me has been saying this for nearly more than a decade now. Uh, and whether it's the guys uh, responsible for the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka from extremely rich families, you, I, I could give you at least 100,000 examples where this entire theory of the left liberal cabal falls flat. That, you know, it's poverty, it's this, it's that, you know, all kinds of excuses which are made to justify terrorism, number one. Number two, I think what Mr. Sain was saying is, is, is very correct. The only problem is that when terrorism started in Punjab, you still had, you know, uh, the, the, the police in various states, uh, you know, on, on, on the same page when it comes to fighting terrorism. Let's talk about what happened in Coimbatore. Uh, what was the initial response of the state government and the local police? They tried to cover it up. They tried to say that this is some cylinder blast or something else. They were even refusing to investigate what had happened. It was only after the clamor was made that they started investigating and suddenly it turned out that this was actually a terror plot gone wrong. Okay. Now, if you have situation like that in state after state, what are the state level intelligence agencies going to do? After all, you don't have IB in every nook and corner of this country. It is mm. not possible. You can't do it. Mm. They depend a lot on the state level intelligence uh, organizations, right? Yeah. Now, if your state level intelligence organizations are compromised because of the political ideology or the politics or the appeasement of state governments, then right. I think this game it will only be played by the terrorists and not by the law enforcement. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it at that, but I am very clear about this. Uh, issues like terrorism should not have a political approach or a political response. It has to be absolutely bipartisan, absolutely apolitical. Exactly. Terror is terror, period, and we need to uh, 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 counter that. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, let's move on to this other piece of story which is coming in, which is also an important one, the controversial Islamic preacher Zakir Nayak. He's now been officially invited as a guest of the state of Qatar at the FIFA World Cup. According to social media posts, he will deliver religious lectures throughout the World Cup competition. India had banned him for hate speeches. Also, he's been accused of money laundering. His Islamic Research Foundation was also banned in 2016 for encouraging and assisting uh, the group's members in spreading animosity. This move comes ahead of India and Qatar celebrating 50 years of diplomatic ties next year. Let's listen in and wrap with these reactions that have come on the Zakir Naik story. A source uh, fairly close to Qatar government has told me that uh, the news is not correct and that some old video is being circulated. I'm not taking a position whether it's correct or not. Let us assume it is correct. And how should India react? Well, my view is that India should not react or overreact because uh, Qatar has not invited this person because he is a fugitive from Indian justice system. I don't approve of the comment, but what I mean is that I have to look at it from the big picture. That is, while Qatar is trying to modernize itself under the Amir, there are others, some others, who want to stand in the way. 
जाकिर नायक को इन्वाइट कर किया है फीफा के अंदर सरमंद देने के लिए जबकि वो जानते हैं कि वो बड़ा कंट्रोवर्शियल फिगर है दुश्मनी को और हेट्रेड को प्रमोट करता रहे रेडिकलाइजेशन को प्रमोट करता रहे हिंदुस्तान में उसके बावजूद एक ये बेबुनियाद कंट्रोवर्सी को रेज किया है जिससे हिंदुस्तान की सिक्योरिटी के ऊपर काफ़ी ज़्यादा खतरे खतरा आ सकता है क्योंकि बड़े पैमाने पर यूथ जो है उससे प्रभावित हुए हुए रेडिकलाइज हुए और देश में दुश्मनी फैला रहे थे हेट्रेड फैला रहे थे ऐसे में कतर ने ये एक अननेसरी कंट्रोवर्सी को उछाल दिया है हिंदुस्तान की सरकार जो है कतर की सरकार से बातचीत करेगी और उनसे आग्रह करेगी कि जो इसकी रिलीजियस सरमंस हैं उनको रोका जाए